So today's session is on uh, designing uh, uh, complex, reusable, and scalable scientific workflows with PyDRA. PyDRA is basically a tool that I started to use, then contribute, and then became a developer of for the last year. Um, it's a tool that was initially crafted from the new imaging community where I come from. Uh, but essentially the neuroimaging people have used the decade of experience they, uh, they built from a previous engine called NiPipe. And they decided to uh, take the learnings of this old engine, which, has, which was written in Python 2 with Python 2 idioms and which had a completely different design, strip out most of the neuroimaging specific bits and create a, uh, a generic data flow engine that I believe could be of benefits to, uh, to uh, every field of research and everyone in this room, hopefully. Um, so I don't have a clear view on the audience, but it would be nice to hear like how many of you have had experience with writing their own workflow or maintain, maintaining one from the research team. You, could you raise your hands maybe? Uh, it looks okay. about 10, maybe. Okay. Um, um, among how many? Uh, Give or take. 40. Okay. 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 So for those people, probably you already have seen multiple um, workflow engine, one or many, and you might have your favorite. So my aim won't be to convince you of switching. Actually, I do believe that there is a need for different workflow engines, depending on the use case. And for those who have no experience with workflows and want to get into it, I've put the content of this workflow is more to uh, uh, people who are really new to making workflows and, and, and designing workflows uh, more than experienced ones. Uh, also, I do know that from the schedule, I'm basically the one who stands before your evening event. So I've decided to strip all the very, very technical and very advanced bits and focused really on what you need to get started. All right, so um, the motivation behind PyDRA is basically summarized in this uh, uh, section that I took from the, the preamble of the PyDRA's documentation. Um, it says that the scientific workflows often require sophisticated analysis that encompass a large collection of algorithms. These algorithms are not necessarily designed to work together and are written by different authors. Some may be written in Python, while others may, may require calling external programs. It is common practice to create semi-manual workflows that require the scientists to handle the files and interact with partial results from algorithms or external tools. This approach is conceptually simple and easy to implement, but the resulting workflow is often time consuming, error prone and difficult to share with others. And the, so the emphasis on this uh, citation is mine. And I've emphasized these words because amongst my give or take decade of experience in the research software engineering fields, I've had, I, I've met this experience one or more. Um, and I can basically summarize, to summarize, do, summarize those into three challenges. One is the fact that we're dealing with very heterogeneous uh, computation. So we, we want to sequence computation coming from multiple tools using different data formats, which makes sense. Research, doing research means uh, using work from other teams and building tools on the shoulder of, of giants. So more often than not, you will not, you will have to interact with external tools or reach for external tools to do your own research. Then there's the issue of reproducibility. Um, and here I want to emphasize, I mean, that there's many definitions of reproducibility, but here I want to emphasize the fact of being able to share or reuse your own research code. So how do I go beyond works on my machine to works on 
a different machine or someone else's machine, but similar to mine, and then works to someone else's completely different hardware uh, in in outside of my of my lab. And finally, there's the issue of scalability. So how much do I need to change my research codes to make use of the uh, computation environment that's available to me? Uh, how much do I need to change to benefit from larger computing power or storage that I get from HPC that I didn't have initially on my personal laptop or workstation? Uh, and these three challenges are specifically what PyDRA is uh, tackling and focusing on compared to other workflow engine. So I'm not saying that other workflow engine don't have these in mind or don't tackle these, but PyDRA really does uh, uh, the, the core of its design and development is focused on tackling these three challenges. So for the remaining of this uh, walkthrough, I will first uh, give you the prerequisites you need in order to uh, get into PyDRA. You'll see that there won't be that many. Uh, then I will introduce you to the core components so that we build together a, uh, a grammar, a syntactic grammar of the things we're going to manipulate to create a workflow in PyDRA and uh, use it. Then I'll touch on uh, with, with more or less details on some of the advanced features that you might reach for. And finally, I'll give you uh, a, an overview of the support channels that are available um, to, to get you going. All right, so uh, let's start with the prerequisites. Um, so I, I, I did tease that there won't be that many. In fact, you need to be familiar with a reasonable recent enough version of Python. Uh, up until recently, PyDRA was compatible with 3.7, but we dropped it because of technical reasons. But that being said, 3.7 is no longer officially supported. And you should be using a reasonably recent version like 3.11, 3.10, maybe 3.9 at this point. You need uh, type annotations and you need data classes. Um, to install PyDRA, you basically go through uh, the regular pip install uh, PyDRA here for this, for this uh, notebook. I'm using PyDRA 0.22. Um, and uh, one of the key design of PyDRA is that the PyDRA package is just the engine. And if you want to install third-party task packages that provides uh, Python task or shell tasks for third-party tools, you will install them as separate packages, which acts as plugins, basically. So here, for instance, ONS is a well-known uh, registration package used in your imaging. I built a, a PyDRA package for it, for it, and to install it, you need to install PyDRA ONS. All right, let's move on to uh, type annotations. So they've been proposed in PEP 4.8.4. It's been available for a while uh, since Python 3.5. It's implemented as part of the Python syntax and uh, some additional helpers are available in the typing module. And uh, typing capabilities of Python have been enhanced uh, ever since. It's also one of the reasons why we were quite happy to drop Python 3.7 because 3.8 introduced some very nice uh, enhancement to the typing mechanism and it keeps going. Um, how it looks, um, basically if you take, so this is a function from, I believe the, uh, the documentation of the standard library. So it's basically the scale function, which takes a factor a vector and applies the factor to each element of the vector. And here, the only way to know what you should be giving to each of the parameters is really the naming convention that was used. So based on the naming convention, you get a pretty fair idea that factor is a numeric and vector is an iterable of numerics. 
Um, but it's really just the name that gives it away. Um, with type annotations, but you, you may also refer it to type hints as well. Uh, you basically add these uh, these type annotations to these parameters and to the to the return type of the function uh, to make it explicit that factor should be a float and vector should be a list of floats. And you can use uh, uh, the you can reach for the typing module to uh, to get some convenient al aliases or or generics, for instance, here. Okay, but as far as Python is concerned, both function behaves exactly the same way, which means that you can still pass any value to any of the parameters which are non-float or non-vectors uh, because of the dynamic nature of, of Python. So you might say, in that case, why, should, why, why is type annotation useful if it's not giving me any static typing guarantee? And the answer is that this is particularly useful to generate code. And that's where data classes comes in. So uh, they've been proposed in PEP 557. They've been available since Python 3.7. They're implemented in the data classes module and they're enhanced by third party libraries uh, such as Atters. I'm mentioning Atters because that's the the module we are using, the dependency we're using in PyDRA. But the, the syntax uh, of Atters uh, is pretty much the same as data classes. Actually, the both projects have a, have a symbiotic relationship. Um, and basically what that gives you is a very simplified way to define record types. So plain old classes that holds data and that's it. Um, let's take, for instance, the definition of a geo point, which is uh, uh, a record type with two attributes, a latitude and a longitude. This you could typically reach before data classes for a name tuple, for instance. But with name tuples, the problem is that it would be difficult to add uh, operations uh, and uh, you need to uh, write a lot of code to transform this name tuple into a proper data type. Um, here with data classes, you basically get a lot of uh, syntactic sugar already generated for you. For instance, you get a pretty printer uh, generated. So you don't need to define a wrapper or a str dunder method. Uh, uh, data classes defines it for you. Um, Another thing is you get also comparison operation as well. So if you want to do equality checking, for instance, that's get that gets generated automatically. Um, and I'm bringing this because we use a feature called fields. So here, for instance, you've defined latitude and longitude as float fields. And they look like regular Python attributes, but under the hood, they are not. They are basically a placeholder for a value on which we can attach other things. And Atters, for instance, allows you to attach validators to it. So again, remember Python basically tells you you can put value, although you've you've annotated your, your, your attributes to be of a certain type, you can put any values in them. Well, with Atters, you can assi at, uh, assign a validator to it. In that case, enforce the fact that you can't construct an invalid geo point uh, in, by means of its values. So here, for instance, I'm defining validators to say it needs to be an instance of a float and it needs the, its value domain needs to be in the right range, okay? I also showed you that I've also added this altitude attribute with a default value and some metadata that I can add, which uh, are completely transparent to the user. But I could, for instance, let's say the altitude come from a different device that records the uh, longitude and the latitude. Maybe I want to put that in the metadata, put the device ID that collected the data. And we can see, so another thing that I did is I, I 
in the the decorator i also for I, I made sure that defining the class with positional arguments was was forbidden so you need to um to name your arguments when you construct the data um and you can see here that I can still construct my custom geo point the same way that I did before. Uh, but if I try to uh, construct it with the positional argument syntax, I get a type error. And if I try to construct a geo point with a value that's outside of its uh, validation domain, I get a value error as well. All right, so as far as prerequisites are concerned, that's it. That's that's all there is to know, and both of these uh, uh, knowledge are either in the standard library or in the others documentation. That's very comprehensive and very well made. Now let's move on to the core components of Pydra. There's going to be three main uh, things that I'm going to cover. There's going to be the concept of tasks. Uh, workflows and shell specifications. So I'll start with tasks and, and specifically Python tasks because they're the easiest to get into and they're the easiest to explain as well. Uh, so what we define as Python task is tasks which are uh, only require native uh, Python packages or a native Python environment to be executed. So here, for instance, I'm defining a function, very trivial function, which basically proxies the uh, current working directory uh, static method from the path uh, class of the path flip module. So I basically call, I want to call CWD and get the current working directory. Uh, so I write uh, this uh, CWD function and all I need to do to define a PyDRA task is to annotate it with a task decorator. And that's it. Um, now, if I want to run that task, I first need to instantiate it, uh, which is the first steps. So I would uh, call, the, call the constructor of that task by referring to the name of the function I've wrapped and provide its input parameters. Here there's none, so uh, the uh, the values inside the, inside the, the, the parentheses are, are empty, but if I had parameters, that's where I would put them. Then uh, this task uh, instance is a callable, a runnable, so I can call it by calling it with the, with the function syntax to get uh, its results. And this result is a result object a bit similar to the Rust result object if, you, if you've if you used it before. So it's basically a, an object that uh, both gives you, both holds the value, the output values of your function, but also informations of how the, compu the computation went, whether it errored or not, whether it was successful or not, what was the standard output, these sort of things. Okay, and if you want to access the output value, they're inside a, a namespace called output and the default output value is out. So if I want to print the value that was run, uh, I need to do uh, dot output dot name of the output parameter, which is here out. Uh, you will see that the current working directory here is not my current working directory of my of my presentation. It's actually a temporary directory because the function gets executed in uh, the runtime environment that PyDRA generates for you. And it will generate for you these uh, cache folders where the results of the computation will be stored, okay? Um, and there will be, this path will depend on where you are. So here I'm on a Mac, so that's where the, the default temporary directories of the Macs are. On Linux, it would be somewhere else. Now let's move on to shell tasks. So here we, we mention tasks that came from Python function, but you might be using tools which are compiled in a native language, in Rust, in Go, 
uh, in Perl what, or, or, or bash, script, bash script. And in that case, uh, what you want to do instead is uh, run the underlying commands uh, based on the inputs that you have provided. So here I'm trying to do exactly the same thing, but instead of using the pathlib module to compute the current working directory, I will use the pwd shell command. So again, there's not that much to write to create a, a shell task. You just generate a new class, that subclass from the shell command task. Uh, you define as an attribute the, the name of the executable that you want to execute, okay? And you instantiate the task by constructing a new instance of that class. And then you call that task instance to collect its results. And previously, uh, we had this default out uh, attribute parameter for the results. Here, I know that PWD will print the path in its standard output. So by default, the result of the computation will be stored in STD out. And you see that I get a, a similar looking result, although the path is different. All right, so of course, uh, the common lines are not that trivial. Uh, there's a high chance that you want to parameterize them with some inputs. Um, for this, you need to write a little bit more code. So you should recognize the data classes slash at a syntax that I mentioned earlier. Okay, so you get this uh, define uh, decorator and the field uh, uh, attributes. And here I want to wrap the uh, tree command as a shell task. So tree gives you the string rep representation of the of your of the, the 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 paths contained within the directory you 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 give it, and you can parameterize with a level. So you can say go as deep as this level. So I'm gonna say all right. By uh, at least there is the a positional argument which is the input path. So this is mandatory, uh, which is this mandatory uh, metadata. And the argstr will be how this is interpolated in the command line interface. So here I'm basically, by putting this empty string, I'm basically saying, put the value verbatim in the position where you're going to interpolate the command line. For level, I need to prefix it with dash capital L. So argstr is dash capital L. And as far as the shell task is concerned, I still need to specify the executable as being tree. And I bind this specification by assigning another attribute, which is input spec. And the nice thing is when you start experimenting with this, it's pretty easy to test it. All you need to do is basically instantiate a task, but you don't necessarily need to run it just yet, you can just print its command line and you'll see what's gonna be the command line that's, that is interpolated from the specification you've created. So you can very quickly see whether based on the command line that you want to generate, like whether the specification that you've written is correct or not. Then to run it, it's exactly as before. Uh, you would just call the task as if it were a function. Um, so not everything gets generated in the standard output. Uh, sometimes you get also files. Most of the times you get files generated from the command lines. Here I'm showing you what a basic backup utility with CP would look like. So again, we recognize our input file, which is the, our mandatory positional argument. And here for the backup file, which is our output, you'll see that I've added two pieces of metadata. One is something called the output file template and another one called keep extension, which I'll come back in a minute. 
output file template basically says, if you don't specify a name for this backup file, this is how you're going to generate it. And we're basically saying you, you take the name of the input file and you suffix it with the dot back extension. And I'm using keep extension here to say, to, to, cause Pydra has the possibility to strip the extension from the, from the file you're using as a template. And, and so that you can post fix it, but don't keep the initial, uh, uh, suffix. Uh, here I, I will tell, keep everything and just add that back at the end. Um, the rest is similar. So we still assign, uh, an input, an input spec to the, to the backup task, and we would run it exactly the same way. We can still test it the same way. So we can still instantiate this, this backup task with an input file here, for instance, the readme of my, uh, of this repository. And you can see that what gets, uh, uh, what, what the common line will be is my readme file and my backup file, um, uh, stored, uh, in, uh, in the, uh, in the, in the working directory of the task. All right. So let's move on to workflows. Um, workflows are basically, uh, a composition of one to multiple tasks. Um, so here I'll give you an example and we'll walk, we'll, we'll walk it through together. So to define a workflow, you just, uh, instantiate, uh, an instance of the class workflow. The minimum to instantiate, uh, is give it a name and give it what we call a, an input spec. And in that case, the input spec will be the name, just the name of the, of, of, of its input. So here I've called them some input and other input. So this workflow, I declare it as having two inputs. Then you can start add, adding tasks to it. So let's assume that I have defined three tasks body early on. They can be Python tasks or they can be shell command task, doesn't really matter. One called foo task, another one called bar task, another one called bas tasks. I would call workflow that adds, provide the name of the task, uh, provide the class for the task, give it a name, and to connect the task inputs to the rest of the workflow, I will just use an assignment as if I was uh, assigning the parameters of the task to a concrete value. And uh, in PyDRA, the inputs and outputs of nodes in a workflow are available through this lazy in and lazy out uh, namespaces um, to connect them. So these places are basically akin to futures in other languages. So it's basically placeholders where we promise that at some point there would be a value coming from an upstream node. So here we're basically saying for foo task, the foo parameter of the task will come from the input of the workflow called some input. For the bar task, it would be from the input of the workflow name of the input. And for the bar task that aggregates the computation of the two upstream tasks, I will connect the baz and the thread parameters to the output, which is available in workflow dot name of the tasks. So here foo task dot lazy out dot name of the output, which by default here, I assume is, is out. So this is how you construct uh, your, your workflow. You sequentially add tasks and connect them through parameter assignments. And at the very end, you need to expose what are going to be the output of the workflow. So you may aggregate n tasks. Some of the outputs, you don't really care about them. You just care about a handful of files. 
that's how you're going to uh, expose explicitly what you want to take out or to expose from your workflow. You use this set output function and provide a mapping whose key is going to be the name of the output. Here I've used out as the key. And I'm saying that I want the output of the BAS task to be the one exposed to the key out. All right. Now to submit a workflow, uh, it's not as simple as for a task. You need to reach for another feature called a submitter. And I'll explain you why we need this a bit later on. But basically it's a context object. So you, you use a context manager to use it. Um, and to which to instantiate it, and then you pass it the workflow uh, instance, and then you can collect after it's executed and everything is cleaned by the submitter, you can collect the result by calling workflow.result. And then you can do whatever you want with the result object. All right, so this is, this is it for the, core uh, features or the core bits of abstractions that you need to understand from PyDRA. All you need to remember is that you can easily define Python task with the task decorator. I, I will briefly mention that there's an annotate decorator that you, you would need if your function has multiple return parameters that you want to expose, but I consider this to be an advanced use case and it's, it will be covered by some materials that I will mention later. You can define shell tasks by subclassing the shell command task uh, class. And you can, you can parameterize the shell task with the shell spec and uh, the shell out spec uh, specification that I will mention a bit later. Um, and you can compose tasks into a workflow using uh, the workflow class. And I forgot to add, but there's the submitter class as well, but we will mention it a little bit afterwards. So now let's move to the advanced features. So shell tasks by experience, they get complex very, very fast. Uh, let's take for instance, a a simple one that some of you might be familiar with. Let's take the shasm command, which computes the hash of uh, a file. And it can be param parameterized in, in a few ways. You can parameterize the algorithm you want to use to compute the hash. And you can compute the mode by which the file gets uh, interpreted or gets decoded by shasm. So first of all, there's this concept of mutually exclusive parameters. So for instance, here, there's different modes based on whether you want uh, to decode the data as ASCII or decode the data as binary. So to encode this, you would declare ASCII and binary as uh, fields, as separate fields, but you will annotate the fact that they can't be, both of them can't be, be defined at the same time by using XOR. So if you put XOR ASCII and XOR binary, then when you try to instantiate uh, the task with both, so if you do ASCII equals true and binary equals true, you'll get a value error. Now, other parameters might be a choice type or an enumeration, okay? So for instance, the algorithm is not any integers, it's a value between seven integers. So, so same, if you want to restrict the domain of values, you can use the allowed value metadata to explicitly set this. So here, for instance, I'm defining algorithm and, uh, the default is one, it's the same as the, as the shell command. 
which means that if you don't specify algorithm, it will be assigned to one. And I only restrict the value to be 224, 256, 384, 512, et cetera. Now, sometimes, uh, so you've seen so far, it's pretty straightforward to compute the arc string. So what's gonna be interpolated as the argument in the command line based on these fields. Sometimes it's not as easy. Sometimes there's some domain logic that uh, needs to happen to uh, compute the final string of the argument. This you can uh, encode using a formatter. Here, for instance, what I'm doing is instead of allowing the user to specify ASCII and binary and let him, uh, he, like the user still has the possibility to set them. He will get an error, but he still has the possibility. Instead, I could say, well, you can only specify a mode, which is either ASCII, binary, or text, and the default is text. And that way, since you can only specify a value, you can't specify two at once. Okay. But here, the issue is that based on whether it's ASCII, binary, or text, it's a different argument. So I reach for a custom formatter here called format mode, which I give it the mode and I just use a mapping to transform uh, based on the value that's provided, uh, the textual value that's provided in mode to convert it into um, the, the actual flag that's gonna get passed to the function. So this is how you would encode some more clever logic when the command line interface has very complicated logic underneath, or you want to simplify it for the user. And finally, there's the concept of dependent parameters. So I've, I've omitted another section of the Shasm function, which is that you can check for, uh, you can you can check for uh, a series of uh, of uh, hash files, and for these that opens new arguments. For instance, uh, if you use check, then you can use one, but one doesn't make sense if you don't use the the check arguments of the command line. If this happens, you have the requires metadata, so you would still define check and one as fields with their appropriate arc string and, and metadata, but one would be annotated with a requires metadata on check, and you can't define one without the other. So, and finally, if you have custom output values, so here the, what the, the hash, uh, function does is in the standard output, it outputs more than the hash sum that I want from, that the check sum that I want from the file. So what I would want to do is pass the standard output, get the check sum and expose it uh, to the task as a task output. So for this, you need to define an output spec uh, by subclassing shell out spec, you define a field for checksum and you provide it a callable. And this callable will take the standard output and convert it into the value that we want to expose. So here uh, you can see from the implementation that I'm taking the standard output, split it on the space and take the first element of it. And if we put everything uh, together, um, and we run the task, we see that the standard output is uh, the hash value and the path to the file and the checksum value that I am exposing in the output object, the output result type is only the checksum. So normally with, with all this, you have enough to start designing task wrappers for pretty complicated um, command line interfaces.
um, as far as I'm concerned for the for the, the the year I've been using it, that's all I've been reaching. Now you can run the tasks, the shell task, into a container if if you want to. For that, you need uh, a parameter call, called container info. It's restricted to shell tasks, and you can use either Docker or Singularity. It's useful for, I think, two cases. One is if you have a command line interface that's very tricky to deploy locally, and it's better to Docker pool an image, which has it as an entry point. Um, or uh, recently we are starting to see these tools which are basically an inference script on a machine learning model. So when you pull the Docker image, you basically pull the weights of a model with an inference script. This is also pretty tricky to deploy locally if you don't retrain. So in that case, you'd rather reach for the content, the execution in the container. So for this, what you would basically do is define a task the same way as if the, the inference script or the command line interface was local to your computer. And you would, you would instantiate the task exactly the same way. It's just that you would add this container info that specifies that you're gonna reach for Docker and the image you need to run it inside is here, for instance, BusyBox. So the only requirement is that locally on your machine, you've already pulled the image and you have a Docker daemon or a Podman instance running. Okay, so it's PyDry is not going to pull the image for you. But if you have the Docker engine running locally on your machine and the image is available, PyDry will basically set up all the machinery it does for the local image. So it would create a working directory, mount it to the, con to the in instantiate a container, mount it with your temporary directory, run inside the container, and then get back the data in the in the working directory, as if it was executed as an, another common shell task or a Python task. Same for singularity, all you need to change is the is the sing, is the is the first element of the container info tuple. Um, a word of, of caution, there is a proposal to refactor this to a generic concept called environment. It's still in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the experimental stage and it will probably not deprecate this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this syntax, which is simple and nice, but it will allow us to encode more complicated environments like maybe Conda environment or, or Kubernetes environment or, or whatever. Now to accelerate execution, that's where the submitter object that we talked about earlier comes in. Uh, this submitter object is what defines the com the compute environment or the runtime environment on which you're going to run your workflow. By default, it uses the concurrent future backend, which is an asynchronous event loop on one core, on a single core. Uh, here, if you want to run it on two cores, you can just specify that you're using the concurrent future plugin and specify the number of, of, of uh, calls with the nprox argument. But you don't have to change your workflow. The, the, the workflow doesn't have to change. This is why this separation exists, is so that the workflow is, is written once and it's the submitter that will be tweaked to uh, submit the execution of your workflow to different kind of workers. We have other plugins, so you can submit to a Dask, uh, to Dask workers or to Slum workers, just by changing the plugin type. Uh, and we have other plugins in the works. So we have a, a Google Summer of Code student who's working on an implementation for PsyJ, for instance. Um, on the same vein, 
another mean to accelerate is to cache expensive computations. So that's very useful if you are iteratively designing your workflow, but you don't want to rerun past results. Uh, PyDRA has, PyDRA by default will always instantiate a new working directory for you, a new cached environment for the whole workflow, but you can pass it a static one, which will be reused uh, on the next call. And what PyDRA does underneath is the, it hashes the uh, input parameters. And if it finds that the input parameters haven't changed, it will reuse the uh, computations. Uh, it, will, it will bypass the execution and reuse the output values of the previous computation. And then there's ways to create more complex shaped workflow. Uh, I don't, I'm not going to go into details because I think we're, we're very, we're, we're going to be very close to the end already. Uh, but basically a workflow is, has the same interface as a task. So you can use the same add mechanism to add task to add sub workflows. So you can basically write subsection of an entire workflow and combine them with the same add uh, parameter, uh, the same way that you would compose tasks. So it's the same, it's the very same notation. You can also map over parameters and do a, the equivalent of a MapReduce uh, um, execution with split, and you can merge the results with combine. But this is a bit more, bit more complicated. And again, there's going to be some resources that covers them uh, in, in the, in the, in the support section. And actually there is currently a discussion to simplify the syntax of these three. So as a summary, um, you can specify more complex shell tasks using, uh, additional metadata, uh, parameters. Uh, you can execute shell tasks in containers with, by specifying some info about the container can scale the workflow with submitter plugins, can reuse intermediate computation with the caching mechanism provided by PyDRA, and you can design an arbitrary workflow by nesting, splitting, and combining. Um, so as far as the support channels that are available to you, there are quite a few of them. Um, I've provided you with the main uh, links. Uh, uh, there's an official documentation. There's our issue and discussion trackers where we we are open about the changes that we want to introduce to the to to PyDRA. We are open to uh, discuss use cases that people may have. Um, every single part of the development happens in the open on GitHub. There's a live chat on the brain hack matter most, which anyone can join. It's at the moment on the NiPipe channel. There's also a co-hacking space on Jitsi. And we try to do office hours. I think it's every Thursday, if I remember. There's a one hour which is dedicated by the PyDRA team where you can just come up with whether you want to discuss or show us some code or or discuss with us how we can help you. We basically dedicate an hour to help you. Um, there is an official tutorial now uh, at this URL. So uh, on the NIPAP GitHub IO slash PyDRA tutorial, which covers the advanced bits, bits that I, I, I teased uh, in this presentation um, much further. Um, and for Q&A for now, Either it's on the Neurostars uh, discourse, it's, it's, a, it's, it's the equivalent of, a, of an official discourse, um, but you can also use the, uh, either the Mattermost or, or the issue tracker to uh, submit your, 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 issue, your, your support requests. Um, you can also look at existing codes, so there, 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 there is an ecosystem of PyDRA tasks that have been created, uh, which have which are of reasonable enough quality. So you can also have a look at uh, uh, 
PyDRA task packages that have been written by the community to see examples of, uh, of uh, working PyDRA code. Um, and so, yeah, the, the next steps after this would be to get comfortable with the core concept behind PyDRA. Uh, I will share this, uh, this uh, notebook. All, the, all this presentation is basically an interactive notebook. So feel free to clone it. Uh, it's not there yet, but I'm going to push it tonight. Uh, you can just clone it and rerun all the code that's that's on this presentation. Uh, I would advise, like the 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 steps that I followed was to uh, first start with a a workflow that you're very familiar with, that you know very well, so that the the logic of the workflow is very clear to you. Start implementing a fairly linear data flow of it, and then slowly add more complex use cases. Um, uh, and and see see how far you can go, and don't hesitate to reach out to to us via the channels that I've I've uh, I've listed before. And uh, yeah, that that's it for me. If you if you have any question, I'm, I'm I'll be very happy to to answer them. Thank you very much for listening. Yeah, thanks, Jusland. There was a, a round of applause there. I don't think you've heard that, um, but thank you. Um, so we have a couple of questions on Slido. Uh, the first one is, um, so there's quite a few Python workflow tools around now. And how does PyDRA compare to some of the, the more established workflow engines, such as uh, Airflow, Silk, and that kind of thing? And I guess related to that, what was the reason for the development of a, a kind of lighter weight package? Um, so to to answer the initial question, I don't know all of them, so it would be very difficult for me to uh, to answer to, to give precise uh, uh, comparison between Pydra with respect to Snakemake or, or any of the ones that you've mentioned. I've heard of Snakemake multiple times, uh, Airflow as well, which I think initially was more geared towards ETL workflows and now has become more generic. Um, so I believe that that's 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 really more of a, of a personal experience thing that workflows are like this sort of tooling where uh, if you go for very generic tooling, it becomes very difficult to express the specificity of your domain as well. Uh, I think Airflow is is a good example for this because like Airflow has like connectors for databases for like HTTP requests and stuff. It's not really things that we need or for for our particular use case in the neuroimaging imaging community. It's not exactly something that we we needed in the first place. So instead of reaching out for a like a a complex design that encompasses every use cases. They they started from the use cases they knew from the new imaging community, and they are building upwards from there. So, uh, and with the challenges that are highlighted specifically in the introduction, so uh, uh, reproducibility, scalability, and and most importantly, I think is this like ed ed heterogeneous workflows involving file file exchange, basically. Oh, thanks very much. And we've got one more question on Slido, which is, uh, where's PyDRA going next? And does its medium-term future look sustainable? So, um, so far, uh, we are four developers on it. Uh, the that's, that's the core team. And then we have uh, contributors from like either drive-by contributors or Google Summer of Codes, etc. There is funding to to keep it going. The, the project is officially funded by MIT. Uh, and there's um, the aim is to basically, like I, I mentioned the NiPipe engine, which is like a decade years old and very established in the in, very established in the new new imaging community. Like NiPipe is not going to receive any new features. Like the aim for the whole new imaging community is to embrace Pydra as the uh, as their next workflow engine. So uh, uh, 
there's not a company behind it, so it, it, it is worth what it's worth. But there is a whole uh, research community. Uh, there's the there's the interest of the whole uh, research community behind it. So uh, it, it is what it is, for what it's worth. Your mileage may vary, I think, for for assessing the the future of it. Cool. Thanks very much. Uh, that was our last question, unless anyone's going to type one in very quickly. So thank you, Gisela. Um, My pleasure. Thank you, thank you for delivering it remotely. Thanks to the tech team for making it happen. Definitely. Last minute. And have a nice end of the conference. Thank you.